Goodness day. Well, my first guest this morning is already laughing. Uh, is the man who was Brexit secretary for over two thirds of those thousand days, David Davis. Welcome to the programme. Uh, Former Brexit secretary, Conservative MP. Hello. Uh, good morning. A thousand days since we voted to leave the European Union, we still have no idea how we're going to leave. It's a shocking state of affairs. It is. It is. Um, the part of it, bluntly, is down to the government not being not to have a strong enough nerve at the beginning. We had I mean, people now know we had a rouse about that. But part of it's also down to Parliament being a Remainer Parliament and voting things down at every turn. And uh, even a government with a Remainer government where uh, you have uh, cabinet ministers publicly threatening to resign if X or Y happens. So it's a, it's a mixture of things. It's certainly not just the Prime Minister. I've got to ask you, you were the Brexit Secretary... Yeah of three or the longest for the majority of this period. Yeah. Is the Brexit Secretary a ceremonial role? <laughs> Somebody suggested it's becoming one. Uh, no, I mean, if you, if you, if if people want to, if you're interested in the detail, we don't want to spend too long on it, but uh, uh, when I resigned, I wrote out in detail where we had had big differences over the whole approach to the, uh, to the uh, negotiation at the beginning when the Prime Minister didn't want to uh, put our own sequencing on it and do the things we wanted to do first rather than things Brussels wanted to do. Uh, when she gave the language on Ireland, which has become the trap we're in now, uh, and indeed later on when she uh, proposed what's now known as but the Chequers deal. But if it's not deal. a ceremonial role, when I say to you we're in an absolute state and you blame Remainers... Do you not feel rather hypocritical for no, not taking no, no. any blame? Do you take any blame no, whatsoever I, no, I for that deal? I certainly take responsibility for not winning the arguments, yes. But you don't I, take responsibility for a deal that was the, created while you were there. The, bre the no, backstop well, we, was effectively agreed in December 2017. You were still Brexit secretary. No, and I and I made the, I objected to uh, that at the time with the prime minister. So but you the, just the, didn't have the impact to change it. Well, I didn't. I didn't change it absolutely. And the uh, there are two ways of being a, a government minister. One is what well, I always I used to call it. Uh, obeying by the Marquess of Queensbury rules. You don't have your public argument. You don't have your arguments in public. You have them in private. And so I did. Uh, and but no, if you couldn't it, win the argument, the role effectively became you were just a puppet. Well, eventually what happened was that the number 10 came up with a different strategy than the one I wanted, a completely different one, and so I resigned. Simple as that. That's all you can do. So you yeah, take yeah. no responsibility for no, the I, deal I, or where I've we are said, now? I've already said I take, I take responsibility for not winning the argument. End of story. Do, but know. in terms of, for instance, some of the, the impression that we had of you of a Brexit secretary, and I'm asking this because it's a thousand days, people mm, are angry, mm. they want to know what went on, and you were in that seat for 725 of them. Mm. Um, for instance, when you appeared in front of the Brexit committee, you admitted not reading the 850-page document that the Brexit department had been working on to show the impact of Brexit across different sectors. You said you hadn't even read two chapters. You certainly gave the impression that you weren't actually across some of the detail that no. was very important. That is, that's, that's, not, that's not true. And, and we well, did say that. No, yeah, you, you, you uh, con uh, sort of confabulated a number of different things. No, there were 850 odd pages of documents produced around Whitehall for each sector. Yes. Right. And I knew the basis of all of them. I hadn't read each last one that they saw there because we, we had them all put together for them in one big document. I did over the course of a year and a half and indeed drove the creation of them. So to say I didn't read them is not quite right. But that's what you did say. That's what you were talking me, about on that said. committee. Read me no, what but I said. in the sense. No, no, read me what I said. Well, I've, listen, listen. Well, I Emma, suppose listen, what, I'm, no, no, what I'm trying to understand Emma, is do you Emma, have with, any regrets Emma, about uh, the way uh, that you perhaps handled it? That's no, all. I have, I have regrets I didn't win the argument. But I behaved in an honourable way, I did my job properly, I made the right arguments, and indeed I've been proven right uh, with hindsight, as I was at the time. It, but but what, I want to make one point okay. to you, and I've had this time and time again, people picking out half a sentence here, half a sentence there, and then representing it as my total view. And it's wrong. Well, and we, it's give, not a, just we wrong. give a great deal of space not, on this programme, so you can wrong. reply. It's not, just, it's not just wrong, it's actually quite dishonest in the way it's done. So I'll make that point well, for what it's worth. Well, could I also then, I have got some direct yeah. quotes that I know that are very striking in a way, because, for instance, on the 11th of December in 2017, you said, what's the require, requirement of my job? I don't have to be very clever. I don't have to know that much. I do just have to be calm. You also said... In July 2016, be under no doubt, we can do deals with our trading partners and we can do them quickly. In December, again, back in that same month in 2017, you expected substantive trade deal to be struck by March 2019. 
We're nowhere well, near again, that, and it hasn't you, been quick. Again, you're paraphrasing. The, the comment well, those about, are direct... with, with respect, okay. the, 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 comment about, the comment about being calm was actually on LBC and the Nick Ferrari programme. He said, what's the most important thing? Not what's important. What's the most important thing about your task? Is it being clever? Is it knowing all the tactics? And I said, no, it's not those things. It's being calm in the face of the sorts of pressures you come under. And at the time, there are all sorts of attacks of one sort or another. And one of the things the European Union does in the negotiation is it attacks the negotiator. It doesn't just attack the country, it attacks the negotiator. And so it's important to be calm and not pressurised. You're seeing it now with the uh, whole, frankly, hysterical response to no deal. And it is hysterical. The, you... the trick is to stay calm. Okay. That's the point being so made. That's not the, the not that you don't that... do your job, but... not that you don't not across the details. You are. But, do but you... calmness mattered. OK, that's a, that's a good point yeah. to make yeah. about negotiation, and it's, I think it's a fair point. But, yeah. but, but with regards to saying we could do deals quickly, and, for instance, by saying by March 2019 you expected a substantive trade deal to be struck, we're in a mess, and we're nowhere near that. Do you regret at times sounding... Like it was an easy task. No, I don't. No, again, people have tried to say, oh, you said this was easy. No, I said there will be technical and tactical difficulties. But I was presuming that we would attack this problem uh, in a way which was uh, uh, the intelligent way from the, from the country's interest. So, for example, at the beginning, uh, right back in June 2017, I said in the, uh, in the uh, public debate going on around the general election, I said... Look, one, two of the battles of the summer will be money and sequencing. Now, sequencing is very technical, sounds very technical, but basically what it means is talking about things we care about at the same time as the things they care about. Uh, what actually happened was when I turned up the first, first negotiation that I attended, uh, that had already been given away by number 10. Now, When you say that, it's given away by number 10, it's given away by Mrs May. Well, directly by the Prime Minister. Give me by number ten, and the. Why uh, won't you I, I, say I'll, the Prime Minister? I will, I will pick my own words, you know, uh, since I get quoted back to me in, in of years. Of course, time, no yeah, doubt. That, so is, pick, that is your I liberty. Will, but I will pick my but own I words now. I do wonder why you the, won't say it's the Prime Minister. If it wasn't you driving a deal and driving a process and mm. driving sequencing that you couldn't get on board with. Well, it wasn't just so many old Joe in Whitehall, was it? It was the Prime Minister. Well, it was obviously with the approval of the Prime Minister. That's correct, you know. How much detail of the tactics she stayed with, I don't know. But this was a point at which uh, she just not won a general election, I'm afraid. Yeah. And, and I know you uh, want to talk uh, about uh, the appeal of the Conservatives uh, uh, and, and how they can and, do better. And as, as was, and was at the weakest point. So whether it was because, whether it was actively or passively by her, I don't know. But it was by number 10, certainly. That's the point. But the point I'm coming to is that the failure to get the sequencing the way I wanted it actually handicapped us through much of the rest of the process. The rest of the summer, therefore, we spent fighting about money. And broadly, we won the argument about money at the first stage. What we did was give it away too easy at the last stage. Um, you know, we got them down from 100 billion to 39 billion. All right, well, that's an improvement. But we should have been conditional on what came next. Again, a, a, a tactical issue given away. Should the chief negotiator from the civil service, Ollie Robbins, be sacked? It's not just one person. I mean, that's one of the issues. I've, I've always... But should, you've talked about no, no, a change of negotiating team in no. your article in The Times this weekend. Should he go as the face of it? I think... Well, no, it's a, different, it's a different argument. The argument is this, that you should actually explicitly have the, politi the political heads in charge of the negotiation, which was not the case throughout the last thousand days, as you put it. That's the, that's the fundamental problem here. Too much power has been given to Whitehall, not enough to the politicians. And the effect of that, one of them, is Ollie Robbins has become the sort of figurehead of, of antagonism in this. It's not just Ollie Robbins, it's all the Whitehall. I would be surprised if you found a, uh, a permanent secretary in Whitehall that... Uh, that frankly, voted to leave. You know, you've got basically a, a, a almost unanimous view against it in Whitehall. So you're pushing uphill all the time with these people. And it's one, that's been one of the problems with the, with, the, um, uh, with the negotiation, which I did not foresee. That I did not foresee. So, so who do you blame for the negotiations then? You say you, you well, blame well, yourself no. for not winning the argument, no. but in terms of the negotiations... Who do you blame? Well, I mean, there are lots of people at fault, I'm afraid. Um, I mean, one of them, and your, and your listeners will see this, uh, as I said, is we've had a parliament which has set out to block this from the beginning. Set out to block but it from... But it's not parliament that can negotiate. It was the prime well, minister. exactly, exactly. And my view is that up until 
uh, about December of 2017, it was going fine. It was, you know, there were gritty bits of it, but there were always going to be gritty bits in the international negotiation of this importance and this complexity. And then what changed? What changed was two things. Firstly, uh, we gave away the language on Ireland, right? Because in my view, there's a very practical solution to Northern Ireland, but we gave away... Uh, emblematic language, the so-called Who? full alignment. Who gave it well, away? Well, it's time I mean, to in, say. In, in that respect, the Prime Minister did concede that, and, and, that, and I, I had a difference of view with it. Right, so the Prime Minister difference. gave away the best shot that we had at a decent deal to leave the European Union. Well, I didn't, but again, I choose my own language. She, was, she of course, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, is responsible for all of this. Absolutely she is. What, can I ask you a different question, then? Yeah. What is it? I'm not, I'm not trying to make you say something. I'm trying to summarise what you're saying. Mm. Because it is complicated I what you're describing. I prefer my own summaries. <laughs> as, you, as you are well entitled to do. That laughter on International Happiness Day is it's good to hear for some people. But some people aren't laughing about this. Um, no, no, no. Um, no. Could, it's could, a serious could, issue. Could, Don't I, could I just then ask a different mm. question? Yeah. I have read, I think, nearly all the interviews you've given since being Brexit Secretary, why you were it and after. I've watched a lot of David Davis on television last mm. night to prepare for our conversation. Good old. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you are still unable to really clearly say, and I think it would be, if, you, if I may say, the right and honourable thing to do, that it is the Prime Minister who is at fault here for this deal. You always say it's Parliament. You always blame nameless Remainers in the Parliament, in MP, in different parties. But what is it that's stopping well, no, I, you no, from putting do. the blame squarely I, I on always, the woman who's I, in charge? I don't always do that. When I, the, I mean, the, the most crystalline... Uh, view that I have given, if you like, that the clearest single uh, statement of my view of the problems was in my resignation letter. And that was plain. But the, a lot's uh, happened since then. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah, politics no, but, but, is the but, art of persuasion. You started and she's out, failed you, to no, answer you, that. You started out talking about the, 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 so the first two thirds of, of, uh, uh, of the negotiating process. And that's, that was what came at the very end of that. Right? That was what I said in terms. And I take. I take my um, duties as a cabinet minister incredibly seriously, including including the, your public demeanour, your public presentation. Uh, I do not view it as, as uh, frankly, tolerable, let alone uh, advisable, for uh, cabinet ministers to go out and differ from the prime minister or to, or to behind their hands or in private brief against. It seems to me government can't work that way and that's what we're actually seeing now we've seen the collapse of collective responsibility and i'm not going to be one who's going to abandon that collective responsibility that's why i say i'm i'm in, i'm uh, to blame as everybody else is because david because cameron though have got a better deal hmm? could david cameron have got a better deal no i don't think so because i mean so, some of the same problems applied aiming too low i mean what the the, the, the you you have a you have a a decision at the beginning of a negotiation, uh, which is, do you aim high and obviously never hit everything? Why you... would the Prime Minister not aim high? Well, go back and look. I mean, simply, you know, you, you've been talking about the facts of the case. Go back and look at what happened with the Cameron negotiation. They aimed low and no, didn't but, even hit that. But you're saying, you're saying he couldn't have done it anyway. Why do you think the Prime Minister didn't aim high? Because you're saying she's basically done the same thing. Well, well no. I mean, the, the, the initial aim was to try to get uh, a deal which was the best possible free trade deal available now she could have said no 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 we're going to walk away she could have said uh, we're going to do something else but you know she she did start out by saying we want to get the best possible trade deal um whereas david cameron i mean he's a good prime minister uh, but he he aimed very low in terms of the immigration issue. And he, then the prime minister, it sounds, after that point in December, started to also aim low. Well, I think probably what happened, and again, you know, the, 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 part of the part of the problem here is I, I suspect I was kept out of one piece of the uh, what well, one piece of one strand of the policy. But um, probably what happened here was a certain amount of loss of confidence in what could be achieved because there was a, there was a tough time between uh, October and December when uh, basically uh, Emmanuel Macron blocked progress in the, the deal. We Which were, strand of policy were you kept out of? Well, the one that ended up in the white paper that I resigned over. Over checkers? Yeah. OK, yeah, but that yeah. was a future looking well, as yeah, opposed but, but to... It, but it, but it, did, it didn't leap out of okay. open space. Um, I just have a message here from Neil, who's listening in Liverpool. Yeah. If you're expecting David Davis to put his hand up and admit he failed miserably, that he led a wrong-headed, aggressive approach to the Brexit talks and willfully misled the country on the UK-EU relationship, we're going to be here a very long time, perhaps another thousand days. Well, that's Neil in Liverpool. It's not my view, obviously. <laughs>
That's all you'd like to say to Neil. OK, we'd like to give you the opportunity to talk yeah, straight back to the listeners. Could I talk about the impact of the Brexit process yeah. so far, which yeah. has lasted a thousand days? We know that the uncertainty has had all kinds of impacts. For instance, Nissan directly has said, quote, uncertainty around the UK's future relationship with the EU is not helping, helping companies like ours to plan for the future. Of course, the withdrawal of what was going to be um, made there, a certain line of car, um, and then the uncertainty for the future. A Nissan worker earns up to around £20 per hour. Mm. Obviously, that sounds quite high, but car workers before tax do get paid uh, higher than the living wage. Um, how much do you earn an hour from JCB? Oh, I can't remember. Some, there was some stuff in the paper about that. Uh, um, I get, I'm, I'm an advisor. It's less on hours than on the advice. That's so it, it works out from your, your members' register. It's £3,000 an hour, £60,000 for 20 hours' work over the year. I just wonder how, if you think that sounds a bit rum to those who are now living with the uncertainty that you're making some money out of Brexit. Making money out of Brexit. Aren't you advising them through the Brexit process? No, I'm not. What no, are you doing? No, Sorry. I'm adv advising them on other issues, on commercial issues, on international political issues, not on Brexit. I thought it was in the context of Brexit you no, were hired. No, no. But in the sense of, do you worry, though, about that connection there? Of course, the, the boss of JCB uh, gives money to the Conservative Party. Do you worry how it looks? Because I know that liberalism's at the heart of what you believe in, us all being in it together. Do you worry how that looks? Well, obviously, people can, people can put a gloss on it that way. But no, I, I, I decided because I think JCB is a good company and I wanted to be supportive of them. And, and they offered this proposal and I said yes. Uh, now, but it's with the backdrop of business with Brexit. And you've well, had a front row seat no, I, look, at those with, Brexit with, with great effect, I mean, you start out by saying it's to do with Brexit. It's nothing to do with Brexit. So it's nothing to do with Brexit? No, it's not. I don't, I don't give advice on Brexit. I don't but, give but isn't it going any, to have any, to be any, within that context? Because that's the context businesses well, the are whole, working the in. The whole of the economy is going to be within the context of Brexit, both our economy and the European economy. My view, uh, and I've made it very plain all along, is that the, the long term, even, even where we are now, with, with the sort of difficulty and the paralysis we're seeing in Parliament at the moment uh, over Brexit, I still think the outcome is going to be good for Britain. And, and actually look at the facts. Look at what's happened with employment. You know, we were told it'd be 800,000 down. We haven't left yet. Wait, wait a minute. We were told it'd be 800,000 down before we left, immediately as a result of the referendum. That's what the previous government, the George Osborne government, forecast. We're actually at record levels of employment. We were told it would hit... OK, but not think... using George Osborne. We haven't left no, yet. No, no, no. But you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just yeah, pointing yeah. out, you're saying, oh, you're, you're, it's high out, out, uh, Nissan as, a, uh, as an issue. Mm -hmm. But in aggregate, the whole economy is actually doing rather well. But it's about yeah. the uncertainty. It's not about that, isn't it? And the uncertainty's well, been created by how politicians have handled well, it. Well, the uncertainty's been created by a number of things, one of which, and then, you, know, you won't like the answer, it comes back to the all of the negativism put across by people who say, oh, it can't be good to leave. The Remainers, uh, it can't be good to leave. Actually, uh, you know, the public at large understand this. The public at large actually seem to be mostly in favour of no-deal Brexit now, unlike most of the politicians. There are polls which show that today, but there are also mm. people who say they'd like another vote. You mean, it depends on what poll you look at. You I know can, it does. We can it say does. that to it, each it, other. It, it, it does. It uh, does. Because I, I was I, interested... I, I think that's a fair point, you know, and, and, you know and, I, and I'm not a great believer in polls, but the simple truth is... Well, when they're useful, they, they're great to quote, aren't they? They're, they're, they're always great to quote, and, you know, we all go in for debate, but the simple truth is, you know, I'm not a believer in polls, but the, but oh, I also do believe what I see when I talk to my constituents. But business I do believe investment what I see. has fallen for four consecutive quarters. And foreign direct investment into this country is at the highest ever, second highest ever, I beg your pardon, the highest ever was the year after the referendum, and it's the second highest in the world, and it's the highest in Europe. Which, so, is, which is good to get out on the airwaves, but for instance, but I, I'm interested, the but then I'm interested if you think the Treasury is not helping people get through this, because you, you asked a question yesterday in the yeah. Commons, you said that hundreds of thousands of pounds are available to help businesses prepare for no deal. You actually said on Twitter, it's almost as if the Treasury didn't want you to know. Mm. Is Philip Hammond hanging small businesses out to dry? No, I think he's each person. Each person in this process is doing what they believe is best. But they, you know, with the the situation, say your say your say your listeners understand, is that a small business can get up to a thousand pounds per person help with training for dealing with customs, and they can get £200,000 help with paying for new IT systems to do with customs. That's that. Who knows that? OK, well, you've, knows? You've, I've tried to publicize and, 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 it. And, and, exactly, and, so good. You've got, so you've got, good. To, you've but, got but, the opportunity to say but my, it, but, but, my but point, your inference my, on Twitter yes. is that the Treasury's hiding my, that. My, no, my, they're not doing enough to promote it. And, and why? And, is that because actually, Philip Hammond well, is a it, Remainer? It, it, is no, that why you and think? Actually, let me highlight an exact story about this, because this was where a real argument in government happened. 
I wanted last March to put in the public domain the preparation for no deal that was going on. Yes. Uh, now, at that point, we were also arguing the implementation period, remember? And we got that mm -hmm. through in the March Council. Uh, now, I wanted it out in March. I wanted the data out in March so that small businesses could prepare. They'd have a year, basically, to prepare for, pre for, for, the, for the dealing with customs in the event we had no deal. And the Treasury and Number 10 as well, uh, or the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, if you want to put it in personal terms. Always. Uh, both. Hmm? Always. O always, I bet. Well, it, makes, it makes better radio, I'm sure. But, well, it's uh, accountability. Yeah, yeah but, but they, 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 they both uh, said, no, we can't do that because that would undermine business confidence and we've just lifted business confidence with the implementation period coming into effect. But so do you think Philip Hammond is still following that rule, which is we don't want to advertise anything mm -hmm. around No Deal because we don't well, want people to feel... Well, I think they don't feel... want to big up No Deal, I think. They put it... To, to, to be fair to him, I think they don't want to big up No Deal. That's OK, I've got to ask you, in the Sunday, in the Times, excuse me, this weekend, you yeah. wrote that the alternative to Theresa May's deal mm. is a cascade of chaos, eventually ending in a Remainer attempt, first to delay yeah. Brexit by a long time, then reverse it. Yeah. You said that you told the Prime Minister that the government would not survive such an outcome. What did she say? She didn't respond. Well, there were 20 of us around the table. I was, I was one of many making that point. What, sorry, when was that? Uh, last Thursday. Last Thursday. So quite recent. Yeah. Okay, and she didn't respond at all. Well, to it, that. interesting this morning. I mean, you, you actually see um, a number 10 a note putting out saying they, they didn't favour a, long, a longer extension. A longer extension. But sorry, the 20, was that. Who, who was that? That wasn't these, the cabinet, because you're not in no, it anymore. No, 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 no. These were, these were people she called in to talk to about, about the deal. She's got, because a number of and you're going to vote for it a third time if it comes back? Assuming they, assuming they resolve the issue of protecting Northern Ireland from being separated out, yes. I okay. mean, that's, that's what I've said in public. Can, uh, we, can we talk? I know you really actually also wanted to talk, but everything's framed by Brexit, <laughs> about the appeal of Conservatives. I, I'm, I'm unsurprised uh, that, that we well, focused on that. You know. come on, you, you no had surprise. a front row seat for most of it. No so, surprise. So uh, no. it's, it's very good to, no, I'm not complaining. to hear from you I'm on not it. complaining. Um, in terms of the next generation getting on board with the Conservatives, the appeal to millennials, those who are younger, who are coming through as mm. voters. Um, let's talk about that for a moment. Have you, have you ruled yourself out of being the next Prime Minister? I don't expect to be the next Prime Minister. I don't expect to be in the next Prime Minister's cabinet, let alone that. But so. you're not putting yourself no, forward. No. OK. Uh, look, the, the, is, the issue here is... I mean, I think, no, because I, I, mean, I thought you no. could have rather a, an eye-catching campaign again. You could have... Those women in T-shirts wearing uh, double D God, I cups. Know, that was I your wanted, last I, time you went for I your wanted, leadership. I wanted to fall through the floor when I saw that, but never mind. It's another matter. What those women standing on either <laughs> yeah, side of yeah, you with T-shirts yeah, saying yeah. it's double D for yeah. me, David I, Davis? I didn't. I didn't realise we were doing that, and uh, never mind. It's not. It's, my fault. it's still. It's still my fault. Do you my campaign. Do you regret it? <laughs> Yes, I do a bit. It was, you do. Of, it was it was just bad taste. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and uh, you look quite smiley when you were standing between. I them. always look smiley. In you public. do. I'm learning this. It's my first time interviewing you. Um, yes. No. I mean, I, I, I asked some I of my. I don't believe you're looking miserable. I asked some of my millennial mates, and I'm not sure sort of double D cut women on either side of the candidate <laughs> I, might I, swing the vote. No, I don't think so. Um, but in terms anyway. of the appeal, because you mentioned that general election, and you mentioned, uh, of course, it wasn't a win for the Conservatives. No. Um, you, you said. We lost the votes, not just of the youngest voters in a recent speech, uh, but also of the 30 to 45 year olds. Uh, it's interesting, just looking back through through your own history, I know your grandfather was a communist, Tony Benn's one of your heroes. Did you well, find... One of my friends. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but you also very much looked up to him, you've spoken about that. Do, do you at least occasionally admire, and certainly during that general election and since, how Jeremy Corbyn manages to appeal to those younger voters? Well, one of the things... I didn't foresee, actually, when, when giving the Prime Minister advice on this, was that Jeremy, of course, had been fighting leadership elections for two years before that. He'd fought two consecutive he leadership had. elections. And the result of that, of course, is you become very skilled at doing exactly what happens in a TV debate, which is interaction with the audience. Uh, and he was good at that. We give him his due. Look. Listen, and I lots of I, those ideas I, about equalising society. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I, I, I know the the aim. We don't. We, 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 you know, we have some sympathy. The the methods he proposed. No. They won't work. And the trouble is with these things, you know, you've got to deliver on the practicalities as well as the aspirations. That's literally what we've been talking about about Brexit for quite a long time yeah. already. So, so uh, and, and, don't, and don't get me wrong, I mean, I, I, I live under another curse, and that is that I'm Jeremy Corbyn's favourite Conservative, <laughs> he, said in the, he said in the papers, uh, because he and I went to uh, America to actually get the last Brit out of Guantanamo Bay. We did that together. So, What's he like on a road trip? 
Uh, okay, you know, he's, he's uh, I mean, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's lots he's of fluffle wraps. He's quite no, he's quite serious. You know, he's quite serious. But... No, he made a good gag though at the British Kebab Awards this week, saying he liked falafel wraps uh, yeah, 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 as yeah. opposed to the kebabs. As again, but the um, so uh, you know, so so, I, and I try not to make my politics personal if I possibly can. You know, and sometimes it drives people like you mad. But you know, but just trying to understand yeah, what know, went on. I know, um, but but there was a real issue there, and it was not so much that that Labour came out with good ideas is. We didn't come out with good enough ideas on things like housing. Uh, uh, you know, my generation, it, when we were that age, 65% of people were buying their own home. It's now 25%. So is that the one policy that you would really focus in on to try and there get is, young people th there back? There is no one. I mean, that's one of them. Um, I would also have a really hard go at the whole question of student loans. I don't think the right to write them all off, but I think they hang over people for a long time. I think they encourage people to go to universities where they're not going to get a return. You know, they go to, a, 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 I don't know, the social media studies or something, and the odds are they won't get their money back as it were um, so there's the, uh, and I think it's also a call on the on the taxpayer because we actually end up paying about 15 billion a year in written off loans so well. so there's a whole series of as things as we end our conversation okay, right, together yeah, because you, We're running out you've of been time. very generous with your yeah, time yeah. who should be the person that fronts those policies oh you you, you can't tell look Oh, come on, you must... You, no, 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 no. You know no, everybody no. in the party. No. You're well, Corbyn's favourite Conservative. I've, I have, Who's the next have, leader of the I Conservative have, Party, have, from, have, from your point of view? I have lived through a number of leadership contests from Margaret Thatcher onwards, and nobody ever forecast the, the winner at Who the end. Who do you want? And, and the reason... No, Who the, could carry those no, policies off Boris? It would, no, it would depend when this happened, because if it's still in the middle of dealing with Brexit, then the person doing it has to be uh, a, a Brexit, uh, somebody who's going to deliver Brexit and so it's got the combination of determination and the grip to do it. If it's after that, then these sorts of issues will be more important, more domestic issues will be more important. And Are we going to have a new Prime Minister before person. Brexit is, is delivered then? Oh... Uh, well, certainly before 2022, and if Brexit's delivered, as I hope it is, about a year and a half before then, it's... It's a hard guess. Might be, might not. When are we going to leave the European Union? Final question. Uh, I'm aiming for and hoping for uh, a good year before the next general election, so 2020. David Davis, thank you very much for your time this morning. My pleasure. Let's get the latest news. It's 10.30.